Hey guys, it's lovely. So I'm going to continue reading the seventh chapter of Liberal Fascism. And um, hopefully we can make some good progress. So, the Nazis were particularly fixated on cancer. The Germans were the first to spot the link between smoking and the disease. Uh, cool, awesome. See, I love the Germans. Fucking love those Nazis. They... They showed us why smoking is wrong. <laughs> but see, everything bad has a good side. Back in the day, there used to be freaking commercials that were like, four out of five doctors smoke camel. What the hell? What the hell? Oh, how the times have changed. Um, but yeah, that that's pretty fucking awesome. You know, there are there are upsides to the Nazis, okay? So, the word cancer soon became an omnipresent metaphor. Nazi leaders routinely called Jews cancers and tumors on German society. Oh boy. <laughs> Oy vey. <laughs> oh my gosh. But this was a practice formed from a broader and deeper habit. On both sides of the Atlantic, it was commonplace to call defectives and other groups who took more than they gave cancers on the body politic, um, which is... Basically, why people say feminism is cancer now. It's still used metaphorically the same way. Um, yeah, you know, I'd be hypocritical to say that's something bad to call a certain group when I do it myself to, to liberals and feminists and all the groups I hate. Um, but, yeah, you know, I suppose you gotta have, you, you've gotta argue it very well to call some somebody cancer, you know, when Milo did the whole feminism is cancer thing with the poll, um, I believe there was a, a university that uh, actually went around and asked students, would you rather your child have uh, feminism or cancer because he was going to uh, present there with his, uh, with his current college tour, and there was people who were just appalled by it, some students, and you know, they were like, how can you even say that? Obviously, Milo went to the school, and I'm sure he argued it very well. Um, but yeah, you know, if you can't argue it very well, that's that's when it, that's when it sounds horrible. It's like, you know, all retards are cancer. Yes. <laughs> Unless you can argue that very well, people are going to call you out on your shit, and you are going to be the most horrible fucking person on earth. Whereas if, you know, you say feminism is cancer and you make jokes about it all the time, you know, people can argue it very well. Feminism is multiplying, obviously. It's gaining a lot of influence, especially with the radicals who are making it cancers, because we, you know, in our community, the anti-SGW community, we, we, we're okay with feminists, like Christina Hoff Summers, but, you know... Uh, all the other radicals and and these idiots who who just you know kind of bandwagon behind it because it's trendy or they're they're malinformed so they just kind of they they follow it because it seems to be the right thing not necessarily something they believe in um you know of course it's cancerous it's going to keep multiplying and it's going to keep basically degenerating society which we can look at as the body, it's causing, you know, unhappiness and bitterness. And there's so much more that you can see in feminism that you can obviously call cancerous. So, you know, I, it would be hypocritical for me to say that uh, they shouldn't be calling Jews cancerous. Of course, I mean, I don't agree with that. I love Jewish people, um, even though I love making jokes about them too. But, you know, I, I love them. And, um, I don't see how they could be a cancer. Of course, you know, me being me, I love the conspiracy theories and, you know, the whole Jews control the world thing. Very, very compelling. They, there's very good arguments for it, too. But, you know, to me, that's just, <laughs> that's just a bunch of malarkey. <laughs> you know, it, it's Meshuggah to me. <laughs> so, uh, to continue... The American Eugenic Society was dubbed the Society for the Control of Social Cancer. <laughs> wow. In Germany, before the Jews were rounded up, hundreds of thousands of disabled, elderly, and mentally ill pure Germans were eliminated on the grounds that they were useless bread gobblers or life unworthy of life. Leben zu Leben. 
or however you pronounce that. I hope I pronounced that right. I don't think I did. But, um, yeah, actually, there was a day I was so bored. I was so bored at, at someone else's house, you know. Like, I go to my relatives every weekend, and I was just so bored that day. And, um, I was looking up Jonestown, and then I somehow landed on freaking Nazi Nazi experiments, and then it started going to different concepts, then I saw the Ubermensch, and I was like, fuck yeah, the Ubermensch, so I clicked on that, and then I clicked on another thing, and then it led me to the life unworthy of life, quite a concept, you know, you're alive, but you don't really deserve to live, that's, that's basically what it is, um, you know, is there really a way to, to, to say somebody doesn't deserve to live and somebody does, um, no, that's why, you know, this ex the extermination part is wrong, you know. When my mom was listening to me recording this, the, the first part of this uh, chapter, she was appalled by the idea that I supported eugenics. She thought I supported killing people. Um, no, I do not support killing people, and that's why ex the extermination of people, because their life's not worthy. Well, they're already alive. You can't take that away from them. I'm okay with the whole, you know, controlling of... Who gets to be in the gene pool, though? But, you know, it, it's very complicated. I mean, just purely, I believe in social Darwinism. If it happens naturally, that's cool. If we administer it, then, you know, there could be complications. What's ethical, what isn't? It's never going to be ethical. But if we vote on it democratically, no one's going to agree on who shouldn't be in and who shouldn't be out of the gene pool. And then there's the idea of, well, why don't we give these people second chances? Who's to say that these children are going to come out the way that their parents did? There's a lot to it. But if we do allow people to have children um, that really shouldn't be in the gene pool, then then we would have to control those children. Because, you know, if we're trying to get rid of alcoholism, which is, like, one of the things, like, you know, alcoholics don't really deserve to be in the gene pool. They're not good people. This is why we had a whole temperance movement in, like, the late 1800s in America. Because alco alcoholism was a big problem, and it wasn't just a problem for the person. They weren't just killing themselves, because that was a big part of the issue. But they were hurting their family when they went back home. They blew their money out on alcohol. They weren't as productive because of alcohol. Alcohol was causing so many problems for these men, because it was mostly men who were the alcoholics. It wasn't really generally women. And, you know, it was men who were causing these problems. And if we were to pass down, if we were to allow alcoholics to keep, you know, being in the gene pool, then we would have to control the children's lives. We would have to tell them, don't drink alcohol. And, you know, you can't do that. You can't control what a person does and doesn't do. That's the part that is also not ethical. So it's like, why not just not have this person in the gene pool? But then it's like, well, what's so wrong with them? And why aren't we allowing those children to have a, their own life? You know, uh, yeah, you know, Maybe, maybe alcoholics will just slowly kill themselves away too, that's also social Darwinism. And so it's a very complex subject. Um, for eugenics, me personally, I mean, I just keep reading this book and reading this book and my, my ideas change with every, every page I read. Um, as of right now, yeah, I, I still support it in some form, I just think it's not ethical. But, um... It still, it still makes a lot of sense. We don't want alcoholics. We don't want pedophiles if there's a pedophile gene, you know. I don't know if there's such a thing. We don't want necrophiliacs. We don't want people who are into very degenerate things. And then you're going to say, well, that's subjective. Well, you know, yeah, sure, you can think so. But, I mean, if you think that freaking fucking dead bodies or fucking children or fucking animals is okay, I mean, I don't know. That just seems so disgustingly wrong. And if you don't think that's disgustingly wrong, I suppose that's on you, but it really kind of is. You know, we can say people have the freedom to do whatever they want and love whatever they want, but th there has to be a certain line at some point. You know, I'm very much into people being allowed to like things that they like, but I mean, there, there comes a point where if they're acting upon it, yeah, you're gonna have to shut it down and just what they like is wrong of course it's an opinion but um you know 
That's why I say vote on it democratically. If people think alcoholics should still be in the gene pool, so be it. They voted on it. But, um, yeah, you know, killing off people, that's just a little too far for me, at least. I don't know. It's it's a very complicated issue, at least for me, to, to, to uh, kind of identify where the line is crossed with eugenics because there's so many there's so many layers to it and there's obviously so much wrong to eugenics but so much right to it too because again it will happen naturally we're just hel- we're just helping it <laughs> go faster um i don't mind if there is no eugenics there's people who are like no fuck that we need it immediately i'm not like that i don't think it's necessary but, I mean, if it happened, I wouldn't be too bothered by it. Of course, there's this idea, well, you might sterilize the wrong person. And that's also the point. You know, there, there come, there's probably a lot of power that comes with eugenics. There will be, there's bound to be corruption if, if it's enforced. So that's, that's my problem with it, too. Um, let's continue. The application of these techniques and ideas to the Jewish problem seemed like a rational continuation of eugenic theory in general, but the Holocaust should not blind us to less significant, but more directly relevant repercussions of progressive era ideas that have escaped the light of scrutiny. The architects of the New Deal, the Fair Deal, and the Great Society all inherited and built upon the progressive welfare state. And they did this in explicit terms, citing such prominent race builders as Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson as their inspirations. Obviously, the deliberate racist intent in many of these policies was not shared by subsequent generations of liberals, but that didn't erase the racial content of the policies themselves. The Davis-Bacon Act still hurts low-wage blacks, for example. FDR's labor and agricultural policies threw millions of blacks out of work and off their land. The great migration of African Americans to northern cities was in no small part a result of the success of progressive policies, black leaders didn't call the National Recovery Administration or NRA the Negro Runaround for nothing. In the previous chapter, I noted that liberals cling to the myth of the New Deal out of religious devotion to the idea of the all-caring God state. Something similar is at work in the liberal devotion to the Great Society. Um, the rationales for the Great Society are almost always suffused with racial guilt and what could only be described as a religious faith in the state's redemptive power. In his book, White Guilt, Shelby Steele tells of an encounter with the self-described architect of the Great Society. Damn it, we saved the, this country, the man barked. This country was about to blow up. There were riots everywhere. We can stand there now in hindsight and criticize, but we had to keep the country together, my friend. Moreover, added the lbj you should have seen how grateful blacks were when these programs were rolled out. Well, the first claim is a falsehood, and the second is damning. While the Civil Rights Act were, uh, Civil Rights Acts were obviously great successes, liberals hardly stopped at equality before the law. The Great Society's racial meddling, often under various other guises, yielded one setback after another. Crime soared because of the Great Society and attitudes of which it partook. Um... Yeah, you know, it's this idea that after they got these rights, perhaps they just kind of wanted more. I don't know. W- what would the correlation between crime and, um, you know, the Great Society's acts that were passed have? You you would think that because they got these rights, less crime would occur, but maybe, maybe they were just too, uh, I don't know. I don't know the right word to, to use. They, they had a sense that they had achieved something, and now they were in more power, so now crime soars. I mean, look, if you see black people today, the way they act is sort of like, you know, they feel self-righteous, I suppose. They feel morally superior because they're black. You know, you can't tell them shit about anything because they're black, and um, I don't know if that would be the same thing in this circumstance. Um, I'll just have to read more, but I don't know, it just seems like, it it seems like that would be sort of what would have caused it, their idea that, you know, you can't tell us shit now, we're gonna do this because we have this now, I don't, I don't know, kind of like that, I, I don't really know how to articulate it. Um, so to continue, 
1960, the total number of murders was lower than it had been in 1930, 1940, and 1950, despite a population explosion. In the decade after the Great Society, the murder rate effectively doubled. Black-on-black -black crime soared in particular. Riots exploded on LBJ's watch, often with the subtle encouragement of Great Society liberals who rewarded such behavior. Out of wedlock, births among blacks skyrocketed economically, as Thomas Sowell has cataloged. The biggest drop in black poverty took place during the two decades before the Great Society. In the 1970s, when the impact of Great Society programs was fully realized, the trend of black economic improvement stopped almost entirely. One could go on like this for pages, but the facts are of secondary importance. Liberals have fallen in love with the idea behind the racial welfare state. Okay, I kind of see it. So, yeah, you know, I have a lot of criticism for the black community because of, well, they kind of, they kind of, you know, hurt themselves, for lack of a better word. Uh, they, they hurt themselves. And, and you see, you know, poverty and um, crime on themselves, not, not just on other racial groups, but also black-on-black -black crime. And um, obviously they take a lot of welfare for their tiny population, which is like, what, 12% of the population? 12% of America's population is black, right? So, they're the minority, but they take up the majority of resources um, for welfare. And, um, you know, no, it's, it's whites that take more welfare. I believe I've seen that before, but it's not like blacks are too far behind, and the fact that there's such a smaller population taking up almost as much as white people, well, you know, that's concerning. Um... So, you know, black people are in this idea that, you know, they deserve these handouts. Trust me, I've heard it lots of times, you know, you know, we, we were slaves, we deserve handouts now. No, you don't. You don't actually, because you're not a slave. You know, you, no one alive now has been a slave ever, right? You don't deserve handouts because of your ancestors. And, um, you know, that, that idea is absurd. Just because you were treated wrong in the past doesn't mean you deserve anything now, okay? So, I mean, they're in love with this, this, these handouts, so they stay poor for these handouts, which makes no fucking sense at all. You know, I understand, there's poor people who do need help, so welfare is sort of good. I mean, you know, honestly, if it were me, I, I don't really believe in this handout thing but you know there are poor people who really do need handouts who really do need the help because they just really don't have the means for it there's hard circumstances and i think everyone can understand that you know not everyone has the means to acquire money as easily as others or as stably as others so obviously people need resources like food and clothing and if they don't have the money to buy it well where else are they going to get it so they get these handouts, which will help them purchase these clothing, and the, the clothing and food, um, you know, very basic things. And then there's people who abuse the fucking system, okay? And that's, that's what makes people so mad about it, because, you know, you're abusing the system. Why should we even trust you? Um, but, you know, when people want to stay in this state, the whole point is to help you get out of that state. You're not supposed to remain poor, and you're not supposed to encourage your children to stay poor so they can get these government handouts as well. And that's the problem with the black community, because a lot of people in the black community do that, and um, it's shitty. So, rather than helping themselves, you know, get out of that situation, they, they remain in that situation, and, you know, How's that going to, it's just going to, it's just going to be cyclical. Every generation is going to keep doing it. And that's not what they need. <laughs> that's definitely not what they need. So it's, it's definitely a big problem. And again, liberals have fallen in love with the idea behind the racial welfare state. And obviously they, that influences black people. I mean, it's just another way to control them. They, they obviously want their welfare. So they're going to vote in favor of the liberals who also want it it's just more votes for them um so you know you know they they <laughs> they're always talking about being um of getting handouts because of slavery well you're really just a slave right now to the welfare system um good luck with that 
So, to continue, they've absorbed the Marxist and fascist conception of the system as racist and corrupt and therefore in constant need of state intervention. In particular, as Steele notes, they've convinced themselves that support for such programs is proof of their own moral worth. Uh, blacks were grateful to white liberals, therefore white liberals aren't racist. We return once again to the use of politics to demonize those who fall outside the consensus, that is, conservatives, and to anoint those within it. Whites who oppose the racial spoil system are racist. Blacks who oppose it are self-hating race traitors. Hey guys, I'm a self-hating race traitor. I want blacks to help themselves get out of poverty and um, dependency, but I'm a, I'm a self-hating race traitor. Yes, yes I am. <laughs> Usually, white liberals will simply opt to support black liberals who make ch such charges rather than make them themselves, but occasionally they will step up and do so. Maureen Dowd, for example, writes that is, it is impossible not to be disgusted with blacks such as Clarence Thomas. According to Dowd, the Supreme Court justice hates himself for his own great historic ingratitude to white liberals or has been driven barking mad by it. Take your pick. Steele summarizes the racism of this sort of thinking. We'll throw you a bone like affirmative action if you'll just let us reduce you to your race so we can take moral authority for helping you. When they called you a nigger back in the days of segregation, at least they didn't ask you to be grateful. Okay. That really... Hmm... Ah, okay. Yeah. That that makes sense. It it's true. The the <laughs> you know back obviously segregation is not a good thing and you know back when that was a thing, obviously very horrible. As you can see, we have made a lot of progress. No more of that shit. But you know, this idea of of, of basing people off of their race and filling in quotas because of their race I mean, I don't care if it, <laughs> I really, I really don't care if I, um, if that benefits me at all, because, you know, I'm, I'm going to go to college very soon, and, yeah, <laughs> if affirmative action quotas, they're going to help me, obviously, because, you know, I'm even more of a minority than black people because I'm mixed race. That's like... <laughs> I, I don't know, that's like at least 7% of the population? I'm not really sure. Maybe even less? 3%? I'm not sure. It's it's in the single digits, though. And, you know, that's obviously going to help me. They need to fill in quotas for their minorities. But, you know, it's it's no worse. It's still just as racist. Now you're just... You think that people of a different race who aren't white aren't good enough, so they need the help through affirmative action and quotas. No, you know, things should be based on a merit. Now you're saying that people who are minorities obviously can't fight at the same level, uh, excluding Asians, though. Asians are the one minority that don't really get a benefit from affirmative action. In fact, I think they even get points taken off of their SAT because they're just that good. So, you know, Asians are the one, probably, uh, minority group that isn't benefited by affirmative action. But all the other ones, well, what are you... It, it's an insult to um, our intelligence, basically. Well, at least to the ones who are intelligent. I mean, you know, if you're not smart and you get into a, a good school, um, you know, obviously, you might have other traits. But if you're like, why the hell did I get into this school? Probably because of affirmative action. And I don't know if that's necessarily a good thing or a bad thing. Obviously, for the person, it's a good thing, and... and Personally, I don't really think it's a good thing, but, you know, if they get in, well, shucks, what can you do? But, um, if they're just accepting people because they want diversity, well, are you really getting the best people for your school? Probably not, but, you know, do what you will, that's just how society is now. Personally, I would just rather not have any of those quotas, but, you know, I don't think people are going to change their mind anymore and they want to look diverse. I mean, now it's more appealing for universities to look diverse. So, um, you know, that's just how society is now. There's not much to change about it. But, yeah, I will very much definitely fight against the idea of affirmative action for as long as I live. It's not helping anybody. At, at one point, it did help people, but now it doesn't. So there's no reason for it. It's outlived its stay, basically. Um, next topic, abortion. Margaret Sanger, or Sanger, 
I like Sanger better, so that's how I'm going to pronounce her name. So Margaret Sanger, whose American Birth Control League became Planned Parenthood, was the founding mother of the birth control movement. She is today considered a liberal saint, a founder of modern feminism, and one of the leading lights of the progressive pantheon. Well, I already hate her. <laughs> um, yeah, apparently she likes eugenics too. But, you know, for the racist reasons, not for the reasons I like it. Yeah, you know... There's obviously people who are racist about eugenics, and then there's me who's just trying to get rid of the degenerates, and if it seems racist, then, um, it might. You know, scientific racism, biological racism, whatever you want to call it, is not really racist, um, per se. It's just, you know, you can't really handle the truth. <laughs> if, if a freaking study says, you know, certain races are smarter than others. Is that racist? No, it's not. It's just a study, and it shows results. And, um, usually, the results are true sometimes, you know. I mean, just me, because I'm a paranoid fuck. Um, you know, sometimes I think, hmm, maybe these are faulty. But, um, I see no reason to not believe that certain races are smarter than others. When it comes down to individuals, that's a different that's a different thing. I'm obviously I'm obviously smarter than white some white people, <laughs> okay? And um, there are obviously other people who are smarter than me. So that's up to an individual basis. That has nothing to do with race. Now, if we're talking about as a collective, who knows? I don't know anything about like mixed race people, what their smarts are, but. You know, I've just seen studies where it shows, yeah, some people are obviously smarter than others. The collective, of course, not the individual. You aren't automatically smarter just because you're white or Jewish, okay? But, as on a collective scale, then yes. The, but, um, you know, that's, that's racism that um, isn't really racist, but people want to call it racist because it judges different races. Um, what <laughs> what is my point here yeah okay so basically when i support eugenics and it seems racist it's usually on the scientific racist basis <laughs> not necessarily because i'm actually racist not because i'm trying to diminish the the population of blacks or hispanics or asians on purpose but because i actually believe that um i don't know a certain trait is is bad in people so again like i don't know necrophilia i don't know what race does that the most but if their fucking race you know their population decreases because yeah that's something i don't want in the gene pool and that gets enacted because of um you know some eugenics law <laughs> and we sterilize people who are necrophiliacs and their population diminishes that's not because i'm racist it's because that group specifically practices that, <laughs> and we don't like it, and so we sterilize them. It's not racist. It's not inherently racist, of course. That's what, I, that's what I'm getting at. But this chick here, she really, like, I'm pretty sure I've read somewhere that she created Planned Parenthood to get rid of more, you know, minority children. But, um, yeah, you know, fuck that. <laughs> But yeah, founder of modern feminism. Must be why it's nuts. <laughs> Alright, <laughs> Gloria Felt of Planned Parenthood proclaims, I stand by Margaret Sanger's side, leading the organization that carries on Sanger's legacy. Planned Parenthood's first black president, Faye Waddleton, Miss Magazine's Woman of the Year in 1989, said that she was proud to be walking in the footsteps of Margaret Sanger. Planned Parenthood gives out annual Maggie Awards to individuals and organizations who advance Sanger's cause. Recipients are a who's who of liberal icons, from the novelist John Irving to the producers of NBC's West Wing. What Sanger's liberal admirers are eager to downplay is that she was a thoroughgoing racist, who subscribed completely to the views of E.A. Roth and other raceologists. Indeed, she made many of them seem tame. Sanger was born into a poor family of 11 children in Corning, New York in 1879. In 1902, she received her degree as a registered nurse. In 1911, she moved to New York City, where she fell in with the transatlantic bohemian avant-garde of the burgeoning fascist movement. Uh, moment. Our living room, she wrote in her autobiography, became a gathering place where liberals, anarchists, socialists, and IWWs could meet. 
a member of the Women's Committee, Committee of the New York Socialist Party, she participated in all the usual protests and demonstrations. In 1912, she started writing what amounted to a sex advice column for the New York Call, dubbed What Every Girl Should Know. The overriding theme of her columns was the importance of contraception. And I agree. Contraception is important. Because, you know, you gotta be a responsible person, right? But, um... <laughs> there's people out there who look at abortion as another form of contraception. Um, no, sweetheart, it's a little too late for that. <laughs> um, so I definitely do not agree on that. You know, obviously she made Planned Parenthood. I have no idea if she thinks abortion is another form of contraception, but I wouldn't be surprised if she did, and I will see if she does if this is mentioned in the rest of the, of the book. But, you know, people who look at that as another form of contraception... Um, no, you're a little crazy to think that, <laughs> but whatever. <laughs> um, yeah, contraception's important, guys, okay? Okay, boys and girls, make sure you got the condoms and the birth control, and if you want, you can sterilize yourself. <laughs> yeah, there's people who do sterilize themselves. Well, you know, they get sterilized, they don't sterilize them. <laughs> Why am I explaining what I mean? <laughs> Um, yeah, you know, people who, obviously, you know, they turn off the switch of their baby makers, which is good, which is good. Um, we don't need any more baby fucking up, you know, we don't even, we don't need any more baby fucks in this world, okay? Like, oh my gosh, babies. I feel bad for babies now because of what they're gonna have to grow up with. <laughs> it, it's horrible what they're gonna have to grow up with, I mean, seriously. But, of course, there is a revolution ensuing in the counterculture, so maybe I don't have to worry too much about these babies. But, yeah, you know, if you don't want a child, you know you can't take care of a child, really, just look into contraception. Or don't fuck. <laughs> but, apparently, that's very hard for people to do, so... Yeah, I have no, I have no jurisdiction on this, because... <laughs> because I really don't give a shit. <laughs> But, I mean, it seems easy peasy lemon squeezy to me. Just don't fuck. But apparently, that's very hard to do. So, continuing. A disciple of the anarchist Emma Goldman, another eugenicist, Sanger became the na nation's first, first birth control martyr when she was arrested for handing out condoms in 1917. What the hell? What the hell? Man, times really have changed. Okay, um... Yeah, that's really fucking stupid. I don't think that's really great, but I guess that was the lay of the land back then. Um, you know, they do that now in other countries where there's a lot of poverty. They do that now, go go door to door giving people condoms and birth control pills. At least, like, I watched, I watched this documentary about population control for my biology class, and I had to... I had to watch it so I could get into the class, and it was really interesting, and they went to, like, impoverished places, um, showing how, um, how the number of children you have affects how, how, um, well off you are, and basically how it affects society in general, and where people who are un below the poverty line, where they, um, where they are populated, where they're located, and, um, compared to people in, you know, like, Western countries, where they have, like, on average two children and are much better off. So, um, that is important to note, and in those countries, they have people who are going door-to-door -door and giving contraception, uh, tips to help so that they don't have any more children, and I think that is a good thing, because, yeah, it does, the more children you have, I mean, I think the more economically worse you're going to get unless you know you can support them. You know, if you're rich, you have a bunch of kids. I mean, what, that 19 kids and counting? I'm sure they have enough money to uh, support the, the number of children they have, and obviously they have a show, which would help them with that. Um, so definitely you can see the difference between people who have a lot of kids that can't support them and then people with a lot of kids who can support their children. But yeah, contraception is very important. I'm gonna keep saying that probably throughout this whole thing. Just, I don't agree with abortion, but contraception, yes. <laughs>
So, in order to escape a subsequent arrest for violating obscenity laws... Oh, okay. Condoms are obscene now. <laughs> alright, alright. Fine. Uh, she went to England, where she fell under the thrall of Havelock Ellis, a sex uh, theorist and ardent advocate of forced sterilization. Wow, I just learned about her in my history textbook, and they did not mention that at all. <laughs> they did not mention that at all. Wow, okay. Uh, she also had an affair with H.G. Wells, uh, the self-avowed champion of liberal fascism. Her marriage fell apart early, and one of her children, whom she admitted to neglecting, wow, wow, okay, <laughs> died of, of pneumonia at age four. Um, that was just... <laughs> That was that was just abortion in like what what like the fifteenth trimester, yeah that's all it was, it wasn't it wasn't she didn't neglect her child it was just abortion it was just late abortion, fuck that. <laughs> Indeed she always acknowledged that she wasn't right for family life. <laughs> oh my gosh, admitting she was not a fit person for love or home or children or anything which needs attention or consideration. This is why I'm very surprised I'm actually not a feminist, because, you know, I don't want children, and I definitely do not think I'm a fit person for love, or the home, or children, <laughs> or anything which needs attention or consideration, except work. That's the only- like, I'm a career-oriented woman, and not because of feminism, but because I- I want to be. Not- it's like- it's not because of any propaganda or shit, like- I read studies and that say, you know, you would be happier in the home as a housewife. That just doesn't appeal to me. I feel like I'm more of a dude. Like, for always. For always, I felt like that. I just don't really care much for living my life for other people. I would get very annoyed very quickly with a child if I didn't- if I wasn't in the mindset to have a child. I would get very annoyed quickly to have a boyfriend if the boyfriend is going to keep bothering to to <laughs> for my attention at all times. Like I mean, I guess I suppose you need to get the right type of of partner, but um yeah, I get annoyed very quickly with anybody who <laughs> who needs me to have attention on them or as this says, att attention or consideration of them at all times. Like I would quickly forget you were even there. Th that's the bad thing. I mean, home life, as for that, I mean, I mean, I would think I'm some sort of free spirit. I definitely would like a place to stay, obviously. Um, you know, the whole running of a home, though, fuck that. I mean, I just, I'm lazy, I suppose. I'm lazy when it comes to things that actually matter, like home and children and your partner. <laughs> but work, very, very serious about that. <laughs> That's why I like doing these videos, because, I mean, it keeps me focused on something. I'm definitely not someone who, um, likes to not be occupied. Like, if I'm not doing something that is, you know, that concerns my brain, then I'm not very happy. I don't like being stuck in places where I'm bored and I can't do anything but look out the window. I mean, sometimes it's okay. You know, everyone needs their time to rest. But if my mind is not working on something or thinking about something, I get mad very easily. Um, seriously though, that's aside from the point. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you know, I just, I, I agree with this lady. I would not be a fit person for any of that. Maybe I have more in common with feminists than I think. Uh, I actually do think I have a lot in common with feminists, surprisingly. But, um, definitely not the same values. Like, I have similar values for many things, but not for the same reasons. Like, it's not on purpose, it's not for some sort of, sort of cry of protest. Definitely not anything like that, I just have those values. But, um, yeah, I always, I always find it funny when I feel more feminist than actual feminists. Um, <laughs> so, to continue, under the banner of reproductive freedom, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> Sanger subscribed to nearly all of the eugenic views discussed above. She sought to ban reproduction of the unfit and regulate reproduction for everybody else. She scoffed at the soft approach of the positive eugenicist, deriding it as mere cradle competition between the fit and the unfit. More children from the fit, less from the unfit. That is the chief issue of birth control. 
She frankly wrote in her 1922 book, The Pivot of Civilization. The book featured an introduction by Wells in which he proclaimed, We want fewer and better children, and we cannot make the social life and the world peace we are determined to make with the ill-bred, ill-trained swarms of inferior citizens that you inflict on us. So again, I understand that sentiment only because I support eugenics. Um, of course, to a certain extent. Definitely not this way. Um, you know, what they think... She didn't give really any sort of reasoning for why they're ill fit, um, other than their race. And it's not even mentioned in here. They're just saying they want fewer and better children. Obviously, she did it on the basis of race, but, you know, there is no argument really in here, uh, in this little excerpt that's featured. But, um, if she gave a reason why, then maybe. But there really isn't a reason why. And so, this just seems like very unfair, to be honest. There's no basis for why they're ill-bred or ill-trained or inferior. I mean, those are very strong words. So, unless you can back it up with something, then no, you know, you can't really say these people are any of those things. Uh, two civilizations were at war. That of progress and that which Saudi world swamped by an indiscriminate torrent of progeny. A fair-minded person cannot read Sandra's books, articles, and pamphlets today without finding similarities not only to Nazi eugenics, but to the dark dystopias of the feminist imagination found in such allegories as Margaret Atwood's Handmaid's, Handmaid's Tale. As editor of the Birth Control Review, <laughs> what the hell? Sanger regularly published a sort of hard racism we normally associate with Goebbels or Himmler. Indeed, after she resigned as editor, the Birth Control Review ran articles by people who worked for Goebbels and Himmler. For example, when the Nazi eugenics program was first getting white attention, the Birth Control Review was quick to cast the Nazis in a positive light, giving other over its pages for an article titled Eugenic Sterilization and Urgent Need. And, um, yeah, there were people back then who obviously saw the Nazis as positive. There were even people who were just like, why do we need to go to war over there? I mean, that's not our problem, that's Europe's problem. Um, obviously debatable, but, um... <laughs> the fact that we supported, uh, the Nazis. I mean, people obviously don't talk about that often, but... Yeah, it happened. Really, really, that shows how racist we really were back then. Um... But people want to act like we're super racist today. I just want to see them go back there and say that. Just how are we on the same level of racism as back then? Because this is shit, obviously. Um, Hitler's director of sterilization and founder of Nazi Society for Racial Hygiene, Ernst Struden, <laughs> wrote The Eugenic Sterilization sterilization and urgent need. Um, in 1926, Sanger proudly gave a speech to a KKK rally in Silver Lake, New Jersey. Um, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> One of Sanger's closest friends and influential colleagues was the white supremacist Lothrop Stoddard, author of The Rising Tide of Color Against White World Supremacy. In the book, he offered a solution for the threat posed by the darker races. Just as we isolate bacterial invasions and starve out the bacteria by limiting the area and amount of their food supply, so we can compel an inferior race to remain in its native habitat. Wow. Okay, that, that's pretty fucking racist. That's actually pretty fucking horrible. I mean, I, I feel like you can see parallels to that today, definitely. Um, but, <laughs> yeah, that's definitely... Uh, quite extreme. I would never, ever think of supporting that. I mean, I make jokes all the time about things like that, you know, oh, the whites are the master race, let's get rid of all the black people, or, you know, all the minorities, or whatever. I say stuff like that all the time, as a joke. <laughs> but, you know, actually reading it, and actually, um, you know, actually giving an analysis on it. <laughs> That's pretty fucking horrible. And this is all from the left. All from the left. Um, definitely both sides have bad things, but I just, the more I read this book and the more I see liberals today, just, oh, they're so, they're horrible. They really are. I just cannot understand how, how liberals can just you know, deny this past and act like it wasn't even a part of them. You know, 
this is quite eye-opening, this book, I think, for any liberal to read. It would be very eye-opening for them. They might deny it, you know? The uh, five stages of, of getting, um, you know, dealing with something, and one of them's denial, right? <laughs> so, that's... It, it's crazy. Okay. Um, when the book came out, Sandra was sufficiently uh, impressed to invite him to join the board of directors of the American Birth Control League. Sanger's genius was to advance Ross's campaign for social control by hitching the racist eugenic campaign to sexual pleasure and female liberation. And this is probably how they hooked more people into the whole abortion thing. In her Code to Stop Overproduction of Children, published in 1934, she decreed that no woman shall have a legal right to bear a child without a permit. What the hell? No permit shall be valid for more than one child. What? Are we fucking China now? Are we fucking China? <laughs> What the fuck? What the fuck is this? This is fascist, okay? And that's another reason why I don't really support eugenics, because it's quite fascist. The whole controlling people who can, can and cannot have uh, children. Um, that's another problem I have with it. Um, but y you, this is obvi This is quite obviously fascist. You, no permit shall be valid for more than one child. What the hell does that even mean? What the fuck? You can't do that. I mean... <laughs> wow, we're not China, okay? We. Re <laughs> this is disgusting, actually, to read. Uh, but Sandra couched this fascistic agenda in the argument that liberated women wouldn't mind such measures because they don't really want large families in the first place. How do you know that? <laughs> You're still controlling people and, you know, there's exceptions to every group. You do not have the jurisdiction to tell people if they want one child or if they don't, okay? Oh, oh my goodness. This is horrible. In a trope that would be echoed by later feminists such as Betty Friedan, she argued that motherhood itself was a socially imposed constraint on the liberty of women. Which, um, if, mother, if, if children are a burden to mothers, they're also a burden to fathers, okay? If we're, gonna, if we're gonna argue that, okay? Because children are obviously the responsibility of both parents, and um, both parents have to provide for their children in different ways, however they agree upon it. That's not up to us. We don't tell people what they're supposed to do, what their roles are, okay, in the household, and... If, if, if children are so horrible for mothers, then they're as equally, they're equally as bad for fathers. Um, people choose if they want that life, okay? If they want to have a child, and, you know, there's a lot of responsibility that comes with it. And people understand that. And it's, it's, it's not a constraint on the liberty of women or men, okay? It never will be. A child's a child, okay? We all, we all know what comes with having a child, and um, people understand the responsibility that comes with it, so it's not a constraint. It may it may hinder some of the the things you want to do, but you realize what you're getting into. So you know, it's not some sort of socially imposed constraint because you are choosing to do it too. Also, you know the repercussions of having sex. So, it's not some socially imposed constraint. People forcing motherhood, saying motherhood's the only way to fulfill your life, very different, and I don't, you know, yeah, again, very different. If that's the case, then yeah, that is certainly socially imposed. If you're forced into this way of thinking that you, the only way to fulfill your life is motherhood, but if you're also saying, <laughs> if you're also saying that motherhood is so horrible, and you're trying to drill that into people's heads, then um, that's also socially imposed, and you're constraining people from actually wanting to have children who might want children. So this goes both ways, um, but definitely it is not, and this is what's wrong with feminism. It's trying to tell women that being a mother is bad, and then obviously that supports abortion, and then people are like, oh yeah, well abortion is good because not everyone needs to be a mother, but once we get all everybody thinking that, well, you know, we're just degeneracy degeneracy of society okay we do need mothers and we do need fathers and we need people to have kids just like we need people to not have kids as well okay there needs to be a balance in there somewhere 
It was a form of what Marxists called false consciousness to want a large family. What the hell? What the hell? <laughs> okay. I mean, at some point, yes, there was a there was a time when people wanted a large family. This was so that their their children could help them on the farm and stuff. But um, by then, I doubt I doubt that was the case. I think that pretty much diminished over a while. Like over time, people wanted smaller families because there was no need for the lar- for a larger family. If you had a larger family, that was on you. <laughs> Sanger believed prophetically enough that if women conceived of sex at first and foremost a pleasurable experience rather than a procreative act, they would embrace birth control as a necessary tool for their own personal gratification. Which is how women look at it today as well. Um, It's more of the pleasure than it is the biological function. Um, You know, because that's always great. (laughs) I mean, I think people need to look at it as both if they're going to do it. (laughs) Because, you know, you might have pleasure, but the, there there might be a little something in the oven <laughs> if you uh, take that pleasure a little too far and too often. So, people do need to realize um, that, yes, it's a pleasurable act, but there's also a biological thing that goes along with it. So, yeah, <laughs> you can embrace birth control, but... Um, yeah, once the abortion thing comes into into play, well, then that's different. So, I'm not... People who advocate for birth control, I'm totally for that. I think that's a good thing. You know, contraception is, is okay. Um, because, yeah, we do need people who are responsible, and we need people to take extra measures if they want. Um, but after that, <laughs> no. I'm not really for it. But, um... Just because you look at it as pleasurable and not the the biological act doesn't mean you're going to embrace it anymore. There's lots of girls who just, I don't know, they don't like the feeling of condoms, I guess. <laughs> and it's like, um, you know, you're helping yourself by wearing it. Less STDs and um, less of a chance of getting a freaking baby. But, um, you know, I don't, I don't want a condom. Shut the fuck up. Do you want a kid? Do you want to do you possibly want a kid then? I mean, people are so irresponsible when it comes to sex, but you know, sex makes the world go round. It's it's one of the few it's one of the many things that makes the that makes the world go round. So so I mean, there's a lot of ways to look at it, but it, it's so it's so laughable to me really. She brilliantly used the language of liberation to convince women that uh, they weren't going along with the collectivist scheme, but were in fact speaking truth to power as it it were. Uh, But (laughs) they're not going along with the collectivist scheme, except they totally are. And um, so they're using women's liberation to um, convince people that sex is good or, or what, that birth control is good? I suppose both. I mean, yeah, you're liberated and whatnot. I don't know if that's really liberation. I suppose it, to each their own. But, you know, saying it's not part of a collectivist scheme. She's duping all of you. She really... I mean, from what I'm reading, it seems like she's pretty much controlling all these people into having a different mindset. There's a difference between influencing and trying to control women. So, yeah. <laughs> this was the identical trick the Nazis pulled off. They took a radical Nietzschean doctrine of individual will and made it into a trendy dogma of middle-class conformity. Um, yeah, again, when you are in a pro-individual um, sort of collective, you know, because, you know, you're like anti-SGWs, we're definitely pro-individual, I would say. And <laughs> the idea that you have to do something to be an anti-SGW, I, yeah, there are things that in our collective we do need to have which is like supporting freedom of speech, right? That's definitely one of the main doctrines of the anti-SJW dogma. But we don't force people in our community to be all the same. And once that starts happening, it's as if we're nonconformists who are conformists. And then that's when a pro-individualist collective becomes a problem, when the collectivist part takes over the individual part. So... Don't fall for it, guys. (laughs) 
This trick remains the core of much faddish individualism among rebellious conformists on the American cultural left today. Nonetheless, Sanger's, uh, Sanger's analysis was surely correct and led directly to the widespread feminist association of sex with political rebellion, which I really don't understand. I fucked my boyfriend. Uh, okay. <laughs> I guess it was a big thing back then, but seriously. It's so stupid. Sanger, in effect, bought off women and grateful men. <laughs> grateful men. <laughs> By offering tolerance for promiscuity in return for compliance with her eugenic schemes. In 1939, Sanger created the previously mentioned Negro Project, which aimed to get blacks to adopt birth control. Through the Birth Control Federation, she hired black ministers, including the Reverend Adam Clayton Powell Sr., doctors, and other leaders to help pare down the supposedly surplus black population. The project's racist intent is beyond doubt. The massive significant Negroes read the project's report still breed carelessly and disastrously, with the results that the increase among Negroes is in that portion of the population least intelligent and fit. And, you know, if it's true, then, y you know, again, it's this idea, what are we basing our eugenics on? Are we basing it on intelligence or something else? And if that's the case, then yeah, but I mean, still, it seems so racist because they're doing it purely on racist beliefs and then they're adding the stuff, not the stuff beforehand and then it correlates with race. So it's purely racist and then the intelligence part is an afterthought rather than it being the intelligence part, the main basis of their eugenics program and then race just being um, a part a part of it, you know? just as if it were class to be a part of it. So it definitely should be more of the whatever they want to base it on and then race becomes a part of it, you know, how it correlates with the results, the, the statistics, but it was obviously it was obviously more racist than it was actually trying to create a more fit society. Um, Sanger's intent is shocking today, but she recognized its extreme radicalism even then. We do not want word to go out, she wrote to a colleague, that we want to exterminate the Negro population, and the minister is the man who can straighten out that idea if it ever occurs to any of their more rebellious members. Wow, okay, that's pretty freaking horrible. It is possible that Sanger didn't really want to exterminate the Negro population so much as merely limit its growth. Still, many in the black community saw it uh, that way and remained rightly suspicious of the progressive motives which is good. <laughs> it wasn't difficult to see that middle-class whites who constantly, consistently spoke of race suicide at the hands of dark subhuman savages might not have the best interests of blacks in mind. This skepticism persisted within the black community for decades. Someone who saw the relationship between, for example, abortion and race from a less trusting perspective telegrammed Congress in 1977 to tell them that abortion amounted to genocide against the black race. And see, this is where I just, uh, the whole idea of racial genocide just freaks me out. Like, are you really serious? Either way, your race is going to die out. So, I mean, was abortion really made to kill off black people or just limit the population? I mean, you know, debatable again. But, um, yeah, black genocide. I mean, there's a whole, there's a whole documentary on it. I just think, wow, this just seems kind of far-fetched. But you never know. I, I don't know. I doubt it now, but... Uh, it, everything's iffy. And he added in block letters, as a matter of conscience and uh, I must oppose the use of federal funds for a policy of killing infants. This was Jex Jesse Jackson who changed his position when he decided to seek the Democratic nomination. So I'm gonna end right there. But, um, you know, thank you very much for listening. Um, if you have any questions for me, because I know I just kind of ramble and I don't really give a solid answer for things at times, then please feel free to, to add them in the comment section. Thank you again, and...